Welcome to Sunday Worship at Beverly Hills Presbyterian Church. Let's, let us prepare our hearts for worship. I'm going to ask you as you're able, the best you can, to kind of close your eyes. You're going to slow down your thoughts, slow down even your breathing, and let your, let your mind focus upon Jesus. And as you do so, the weights that you carry, the worries of your heart, they're going to get cranky. They're going to demand your attention. And here's, here's one of the secrets of worship. They don't get to demand your attention. They don't, you don't need to give them your attention because Jesus says, give them to him. He says, cast your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So as you're able to, best you're able to lay those things down and trust Jesus Christ to carry them for you. And again, go into a place of slowing down. Allow your focus to, to rest upon Jesus. And now if anything kind of pops in your mind, demanding your attention, just kind of gently push past them and focus on Christ. This is one of the ways that we slow down so that we can abide, so we can rest in the presence of Jesus and be, uh, be open to whatever he is doing and he is about in our relationship with him. So from that place of abiding, let us go into worship through music. Thanks for tuning in with us today. Let me share with you some announcements for things going on in the life of our church. The first thing is new members class. So uh, in this time of digital services, we, we are seeking to grow our membership still. We want the body of Christ to continue to grow. We want our congregation at BHPC to continue to grow. And we know we have some new viewers. We have some new people interested. So we're going to be putting on a new members class for those to get more acquainted with our church and understand more about what, what we're about and our mission. And um, yeah, so we also want to invite people to continue to join our congregation so actually you can take a moment and there's a share button below um, in the YouTube screen click that share button a link will pop up and send that link to somebody who you think needs the message we want to continue to invite people into the body so keep a lookout for those details for the new members class and uh, feel free to share as you feel so moved 
Uh, now, speaking of the body, we are putting on the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. Now, we've done the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality course. The Relationships course is kind of the next component of that, uh, teaching us how to grow together uh, emotionally, to improve the quality of relationships and our spiritual relationships with one another. Now, the class technically started uh, yesterday, but we still invite people to sign up and join if you are interested, but you have to let us know. So please email us. Uh, please follow the links in your bulletin as well so we can get you on the list and get you the Zoom link invitations. Uh, now, speaking of growing emotionally and in relationships, I encourage you guys to participate in our, our weekly rhythms, our Bible studies. We have the men's discipleship breakfast that happens every other week on Tuesday mornings, and we have the Wednesday night Bible studies happening uh, at 7 p.m. every week. We invite you to, to get into these because... This is one of the ways that we abide with, with God is we, we learn from other believers how to abide and we abide by being in his word, learning about him and his character and drawing near to him in that way. So we encourage you guys to get involved as you feel led. Lastly, um, media. There's actually one more. But media, we need media volunteers. I don't need to spend too much time on this. Everything that we do about this requires and is greatly helped by helping hands. So if you want to get involved with that, please email me at calvin at bhpc.org or info at bhpc.org. Anyone, any and all are invited to help. Uh, lastly, lastly, I promise, is giving. Thank you so much for your giving. There's a link in the corner of the screen so you can give digitally. You can also send a check to the church, but we thank you for your giving. Obviously, we can't do any of this without your continued support, um, and we encourage you to keep giving as you feel so led, but please know we appreciate it. So now let's bow our heads together and come before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you. We continue to plead and implore, God, that you would draw us deeper into your life, God, that you would nourish us with your peace, God, that surpasseth, surpasseth understanding, God, that you teach us how to abide in the way that Christ did when he walked the earth, Lord, knowing that we have the indwelling spirit of Christ within us. Lord, I, I pray, especially now, God, that you would teach us how to stop, God, how to slow down, how to come before you and live in you in the difficult times, but, but also in the good times as well, in, in the triumphs and successes that we experience. It is equally as important to acknowledge where that success comes from, God, where the praise is due, Lord. So I pray that we can be people who are living with you in, and in you, finding peace from you in, in the times where we need it, but also finding joy and gratitude in the times that we are being blessed by you, Lord. And we need that joy now more than ever, God. We need to be people who reflect that. So be with us today. Be with us during the, the time of preaching and lessons. Open us to receive your teachings today, God. And let us ever be prayerful people, Lord, and let us now pray together in the way that your son taught us to, which is to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. 
I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, and I worship you, yeah, I worship you, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are yeah that is who you are 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 even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working never stop never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, that is who you are. 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 That is who you are.
Will you please pray with me? Our gracious Lord, we, we bless you and we praise you and we give you this time. We ask that you would take this time in our living rooms and on our phones, wherever we happen to be. Take this time and use it. Create church in us, through us, around us in ways that draw us closer to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I finished seminary 16, 17 years ago now. And at the time, a good friend of mine worked at a church that was fairly nearby. And he, he started this thing called a blog, which was new to me at the time. It was, it was really neat. It was this, he would pontificate about ministry and about God and about theology uh, online and these, these, these entries. It was, like, it was like half diary, half theology magazine. And after some time, it ended up, there was a bunch of people that started to follow him. They began to read every single thing that he wrote. Not much longer after that, he, he actually called me with a proposition. He said to me, Andrew, here's the thing. I want you to join me. I want you to partner with me. This, this blog thing, it's a lot harder than I thought. There's a lot more work than I, than I really need just for myself. And, and, I, and he, he trusted my writing. And he trusted my voice. And he, he wanted me to join him. And now I was fairly fresh at a seminary at that point. I was a, a youth pastor at a small Presbyterian church in, in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. I don't know if you, if you know the one. And, and I told him I need to pray about it. I need to think about it. Frankly, it was, it was an incredible opportunity. It was, a, it was a chance for me to kind of spread my wings, to write a little bit. I've always wanted to be a writer. But when I prayed about it, this overwhelming sense that I got from God was, was no. That God wanted me to focus on something else, that this blog was the, the path for my friend. It was not necessarily the path for me. Now, several years after that, my friend wrote a book and got published. Then he wrote another book got published again. The reason he was able to get published so easily in some ways because he already had quite a following with his, with his blog. And, and at some point after his second book, I remember he called me up and we were talking. And as we were talking, it came very apparent to me that I was actually sitting in the exact same chair, looking outside the exact same window at that faux gouty house next to the church as I was when he called me so many years ago and invited me to join him on his blog. And I had to think, well, had I, had I missed my chance? Had I, had, I, had I not done, I, see, I, I was still a youth pastor. I was still taking kids to camp. I was still playing broom ball, which, by the way, is a fantastic game. And this guy, this friend of mine, who went to seminary with me, was, a, was an author. He, he was a, an in-demand public speaker at churches all across the country. Now, this thought came into my mind because I was having a conversation with a member of this church about, about all the wasted time during COVID. We talked mainly about our kids and the time that they seemed to be losing. And, and we were wondering if there was any way we could, would unwind some of the bad habits they were getting from in school and in their schooling and in their, um, in their screen time and those kind of things. But we also talked about our own lives. Uh, it felt a bit like we were just trying to hold serve. We we're just kind of waiting this, this whole thing out. We were waiting for somebody to figure out what was wrong and to fix it so we could get back to normal. But I, I had this sinking thought that maybe, maybe I was also wasting time again. Well, let me illustrate that in a different way. The other day, my wife and I, we dropped by a friend's house to drop off food because they were going through something. And, and from you know appropriate socially distanced place, they began to point out the things that they were doing in their house uh, to make their house better during the time of COVID, which was great because it, it made their house better, but also made their lives better. And we were, we were ecstatic for them. We were very happy and we, it was fantastic. But later that night, as my, my head hit the pillow, I began to ask myself, well, Andrew, what have you done in the last nine months? I hadn't done anything to improve the house. In fact, the house story for me for 2020 had more to do with this uh, kind of family of gophers that decided to move into the, the postage stamp of a front lawn that I had. And so I've been kind of fighting a losing battle with them. I've tried everything. I've tried those little, those little spikes that kind, of, that kind of buzz and they're supposed to kind of drive the, the gophers or the groundhogs out of your yard. And I've tried um, poison worms that you're supposed to find their little burrows and you, you kind of throw them in there and that's supposed to do a little bit more than just drive them out. I've even taken some advice from, from um, some relations from Tennessee that I have and they said to, to stick cat litter, to use, use cat litter in the holes. And so you know you've arrived when you, you spend your Saturday afternoon pawing through cat litter to find the right kind of pieces that'll drive the gophers out of your front lawn. More than positive headway, I've felt more like Bill Murray in Caddyshack. More than making um, use of the time like my friend in his house, I was, I was losing ground to gophers. Now, I know that I'm not alone in this. 
I know that a lot of us feel like we're just, we're just trying not to lose ground. We're just trying to wait this thing out. And then in the midst of it all, I've, I've kind of launched a sermon series a couple weeks ago with a fairly strange suggestion. The idea is that I want us to focus on abiding in Christ Jesus. Now, maybe that makes sense in kind of a, a Bruce Lee kind of way. One of those, you know, Bruce Lee was very famous for saying that his karate was adaptable to all situations. And he'd say, be like water. And so, so maybe in the sense we've, we have to be in the same place, so we might, as well, we might as well abide, allow our faith to take the shape of the lockdown. But in some ways, that doesn't really do justice to this idea and the command of God to abide in Christ because, because God calls us to abide in Christ even when our plate is full. God calls us to abide in Christ even when we're allowed outside, we're allowed to go eat, eat at restaurants and go on vacations. Perhaps right now, the circumstances for us are, are making it so that we're more open to abide. But the call to abide is actually the heart of what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you the text where this kind of idea of abiding is kind of most clearly put out. It's a text that, that Calvin actually preached from a couple weeks ago, and I want to read you or, or reread you the first five verses of John chapter 15. Let me read this for you. In this text, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, this is a fairly fairly foreign analogy for most of us. The, the truth is that some of us can't even get grass to grow in our front yard because of the gophers, much less do we know anything about grapes and vineyards and how to grow grapes for wine. But the idea of the people of God being a vineyard goes back all the way through the Hebrew scriptures. It's also a, a farming reality that's pretty, pretty right in front and center for most people who live in Israel, something they, a reality for most of them. But perhaps though, it wasn't the most flattering metaphor. Because the thing is, grapes for wine are, are notoriously hard to grow. They don't grow naturally. If given kind of free reign to their own inhibitions, they don't bear fruit, not fruit that leads to wine. You see, a fruitful vineyard needs to be meticulously nurtured, meticulously maintained. Shoots need to be trimmed and gently balanced to, to balance where the life of the vine goes. Some of it to the strength of the branches, some of it to the fruit. Too much fruit and not enough strength in the branches and that's no good. Too much of a woodiness in the, in the vine and it doesn't bear fruit. Nevertheless, the, the greatest amount of time spent in harvesting grapes is still waiting. It's waiting for the vine to do what the vine does. And when the vine does what the vine is supposed to do, the fruit is second to none. The analogy here is that the, the people of God are a vineyard. They are created to bear fruit. And when we enable Christ or when we abide in Christ, we enable God to kind of, kind of do things through us, that's exactly what we do. Alternately, when we don't abide in Christ, we don't bear fruit. We need Christ to bear fruit in us, through us, and for us. But the part of this text that I actually want to focus on today, the thing that I want us to kind of highlight more than anything are verses one and two. And it's this, this idea that it tells us that God is actually the gardener. God is the one who prunes. God is the one who nurtures. God cuts and trims to make sure that the branch is a, is a perfect balance between strength and fruitfulness. And this is great for understanding the metaphor, but, but I don't want you to miss the, what it says to us about, about you and me and about God. It tells us that God is the one, God is the one who's going to make sure that we are fruitful. It isn't actually our smarts or our good look or our grits or grit or our gumption. It's not, it's not the job that we have. It's not the school we went to. It's not how much money we have in the bank account. You see, apart from God, these things will just lead us to be, to be wild vines that grow into a thicket and don't actually bear fruit. But in God's hands, no matter who you are, no matter whatever you may have going for you, even if you don't have anything going for you at all, God can bring you to fruitfulness. God will bring you to fruitfulness. You see, our job is simply to abide. Jesus provides the health, God shapes our life, and we bear fruit. Now, I want to jump from this text about the vine into another text, but I want to take the basic idea with us, because I, I want to take this idea from this metaphor place into kind of a more of a, a context of real life. And the, and the context I want us to talk from is in a town called Corinth. 
the apostle Paul planted a church in Corinth. And, and as far as churches go, this one was pretty on fire, at least as far as the Holy Spirit went. Incredible, miracle, miraculous things were happening. People were, were speaking in tongues. People were being healed. There was, uh, people were casting out demons. Uh, the Holy Spirit was popping in, in Corinth. They were an accomplished bunch. But Paul wasn't all that impressed. In some ways, it almost seemed to worry him. It almost like he had this sense that, that maybe he thought part of the church was actually in it for, for the, um, the greatness in these things rather than the fruitfulness in God. You understand that, that nuance? Wisdom can lead to worldly success. It can be the kind of thing that, that um, a blog takes off <laughs> or a podcast or, or something goes great and all of a sudden you've got a book deal and you've got a, a teaching position. But, and what Paul, I think, was afraid of is that there was a part of the church in Corinth that was, that was kind of seeking the book deal in it all. And maybe it wasn't that brazen. Maybe, maybe they just wanted to feel affirmed. They wanted to feel a chosen. They wanted to make sure that they weren't, they weren't kind of wasting time in life. They wanted to be able to say, of course, I'm chosen by God. Can't you see it in all the things that I do? Can't you see it by, by the number of followers on my blog? Or the, didn't you see me cast out demons on my TikTok account? You see, Corinth seemed to be the kind of church that my blogging buddy would have cleaned up in. They would have loved his books. They would have loved the number of followers he had on his Instagram feed. But, but me? Or us when we're in COVID, we kind of a harder sell. I mean, we're not, I'm not casting out demons every day. I can't even get gophers out of my front yard. You see, Corinth's mindset, it would have been harder. It would have made it almost worse because I, we all want to be our best. We want to be fruitful for God and for our family and for ourselves. And, and the truth is, in Corinth, I'm not sure we would have measured up. And so Paul, he writes him a letter. In the letter, he doesn't tell them what a great job they're doing. Instead, he gives them something of a reality check, at least in the part that I want to read for you. Let me read for you now um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 26 through 31. Paul writes, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what was foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what was weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce not to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see what Paul was doing here as he was kind of peeling back their success. He kind of wanted to see that, they wanted to see what, what was actually important. He wanted them to see the, the, uh, the abiding that was underneath all of the fruitfulness that was going on. He wanted them to, and maybe even begin to organize their lives around the abiding. And he says to them, consider who you were. Consider where you were before you met Jesus. And see, not many of them are rich, not many were wise. Not many were powerful. They weren't the kind of people that, you know, you, you do a venture capital startup with. They weren't the kind of people you hire for kind of this new thing you're doing. They don't put them on your board of directors. They weren't the kind of people you choose. And yet God deliberately chose them. And he didn't choose them because they had a book deal. He actually chose them because they didn't. You see, he chose them because he he intended to prune them, to grow them, that in them the wisdom and the righteousness, the sanctification and redemption of God might be apparent to everyone. He, he chose them because he was going to make them fruitful with him in Christ. He chose them so that everyone would look at them and know that God had created them, created all of us to be fruitful in Christ. He, he chose them in some ways so that, that it would shame people who are trying to be fruitful and successful apart from God, that they would, they would look at them and be able to say, ah, now I know what I was missing. God chose them so everyone, everyone would know what true fruitfulness is and where to find it and to know that it was an idea that was open to everyone. Did you get it? Paul was reminding them God chose them to make them, to make them great. God chose them with the intention of making them their best and making them, them fruitful. God chooses us with the intention of making us our best, making us fruitful. Now, I think the word consider in this text can be something of a spiritual discipline. Every once in a while, it might be wise for us all to kind of step back and consider who we were before Christ was in our lives, kind of, kind of strip things away. The other day, I had a, a meeting with the deacons of the church. And in order to kind of get an idea of like, how are you doing in the midst of things and, and where they were and struggling with the different things going on in life, I, I asked them to kind of rate themselves in, in a, on a, a scale of one to 10. 
Now understand that these are, these are deacons. They're normal people like you and I, but they're also people who have, who have kind of hearts to help, have hearts to care for people. They're, they love deeply. And so, so most of them, they rank themselves somewhere between seven and nine. I think there was even somebody who said there were nine and a half. And, and it was even very more inspiring than that because as they kind of said where they were, they, they gave reason. They said, look, I know there's these terrible things going on, but at the same time, I know that God is in the work in the midst of it. I can see, I can feel it. I have such hope and expectation that he's going to do something. It was inspiring. Even in the midst of the inspiring, though, I had to, I had to kind of chuckle, chuckle a little bit to myself because the truth of the matter is, is that that I'm somebody who, I've never seen a nine and a half. I've never been to a place of nine and a half anyway. I'm, I tend to be a little bit more cynical, so I probably top out somewhere around five and a half, six. So as I was kind of chuckling about that, thinking about it, it, it occurred to me that I wasn't always that way. It occurred to me that before, before I gave my life back to Christ, I was actually even more cynical than I am now, and I, I was moody and maybe even depressed at times until... Well, until Jesus. And it was in that stepping back to consider that I, I really began to smile and even laugh in a positive way. I realized, that, I realized that Jesus has spoken so much joy into my life, enough joy to move me from a two to a six. Maybe, I guess, I get a little, a little older, I'll, I'll grow up and I'll, I'll be able, maybe I'll be a nine and a half. In our text, the Apostle Paul is pretty clear. Anybody who's boasting about what they've done Anybody who in, in, is the opposite that feels like a, a failure because of the things that they have failed to do or the ways they've fallen short, both of them are looking at things all wrong. Both of them are out of balance. They're out of the balance that leads to fruitfulness. Both are failing to abide because to abide is to, is to trust God to make us fruitful. To abide is to allow God to do his good work in us as we yield to him. To abide is to trust that God will bring to completion the good work that he has begun in us. You see, contemplating is a good discipline because it opens our perspective. It's only by looking back that I was able to see the, the fruit of joy that was in my life because of Jesus Christ, that I was able to connect it directly to the life of Christ in me, the nurturing of God, the shaping of, of my life by God's hands and, and the abiding in Christ. You see, to Paul, that's the appropriate place to, bur- to boast. You see, the only appropriate place it is to, to boast is, is with thanksgiving and rejoicing. It is when you, when you begin to realize how valuable you are to Jesus, how valuable you are to God, and begin to, to recognize the place that God is moving in you to bring you to fruitfulness. It's to trust the fruitfulness that, that Christ is becoming in us. So I started by telling you many years ago about this opportunity that I feel like I had and I, I didn't really take advantage of. And, and, and maybe I wondered about it, but I didn't wonder about it very long if I'd missed some kind of opportunity. And the reason I didn't wonder about it is I know that when I considered this path that my friend, my blogging author friend was on, I knew that, I knew that God had said no. And I knew that God had plans and purposes for me. I know that God still has plans and purposes for me. And I, and I want the plans that God has for me more than any kind of anything that my ego might dr- dream up. You see, because with all that said, one of the things this text from the Apostle Paul does is it shows us that we are in good hands. When he was writing to the church in Corinth, he pointed out to them that, that not many of them were wise, that not many of them were noble, that not many of them were powerful when this all began. But, but the point was not to boast in these things or to strive to get these things so that they could boast. Now, the point was that in Christ, in their abiding, in God's pruning, Christ would become their wisdom. Christ would become their nobility as he, as he saved them into the household of God. Christ would become their power as, as he moved them in sanctification and in redemption. Christ had become, or rather Christ, or rather they would become in Christ all that they had lacked at the beginning and even more. Do you see the promise in this for us? The promise for us is that we will be fully who we are created to be in Christ Jesus, with Christ Jesus, abiding in Christ Jesus. And if it's it's through abiding, the good news, if it's through Jesus' life in us, God's pruning us, God's God's shaping us and forming us, if it's through those things, then those things, that, that greatness can never be taken from us. Friends, we are in a time period where much seems to be eroding, where where it seems like all we can do is wait. We don't have much power. We don't have much wisdom. We don't have much nobility for this moment, but, but we are chosen by God to abide. And, and so let us abide. Let us yield ourselves to the working of God in us. Let us, 
Let us trust that we are not missed opportunities because the fruitfulness of our lives comes because, because God is the gardener, because Jesus is the vine, and because we abide in them. Let us abide in Christ. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we turn to you now. Um, maybe in some ways it feels cheap to turn to you in times where, where all the things we are used to trying to do to get success and to get fruitfulness seem like they're, they're coming up more empty than normal. And nevertheless, I think you still just call us to abide in you. So Lord, teach us. Teach us this week to rest in you, to yield to you, to know your hands shaping us and forming us, to know your life in us. Teach us to abide in your love that we may be part of, uh, of the fruitfulness that you, that you want to give to the world in us and through us and for us. We thank you. We praise you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now go in peace. Go in peace, trusting yourself to God's work in you, believing that, that you were created for fruitfulness. Go in peace and abide in Christ, my friends. Amen.